What's up, everybody? I'm the Gojiryu Philosopher, and as promised, here is the first of the videos on how kata came to exist. The first stage of kata's development traces all the way back to karate's influence that it received from the Chinese martial arts. Now, to say that Okinawan martial arts can all be traced back to China is, as we'll be seeing, especially in stage 4, quite an exaggeration, since the Ryukyu kingdoms were strategically located within, and therefore able to trade with, almost every territory with a coastline in what we now call Southeast Asia. For that reason, karate's influences can reasonably be said to have come from all across this region, but the history of kata specifically is no doubt one of China's largest influences on Okinawan karate. Even before kata were developed as a form of teaching people fighting skills, practicing techniques of fighting, either with weapons or without, was an important focus for people all around the world. Interpersonal conflict is, after all, a far-reaching, if not universal part of human history, not to mention the history and behavior of almost all animals. Through much trial and error, whether these were fights that were intentionally sought out or fights that were unintentionally forced upon one, people naturally would have discovered certain methods of fighting that were much more effective than others. Once discovered, these fighting techniques were practiced and trained to make the practitioner more effective in fighting, whether as part of the necessity of protecting themselves against the attacks of others, or as a means of creating a stronger fighting force so that battles and even wars could be won with inferior numbers or lesser technology. The same pressures that compelled humans to develop better weapons, sharper swords, more powerful bows, even gunpowder and cannons, also would have compelled them to develop techniques for using those weapons, or, in the event that a weapon wasn't to hand, techniques for using their own hands or feet or even heads. So far, this should all seem pretty obvious. However, when it came to studying and practicing these techniques, one would, generally speaking, prefer to practice them alongside a partner. This sort of practice would either end up looking like the kind of two-man drills that you'll sometimes see in a boxing gym, or perhaps like yakusoku kumite, where a predetermined attack was met with a predetermined response. These drills would then be practiced over and over again until they were solidly memorized, and only at that point would they go on to trying to use those skills in a more free-fighting scenario. Just like how you probably wouldn't throw a first-time student into a sparring match without at least getting them solid on the basics of how to throw a punch, free sparring drills were generally reserved for after you had a few drills pretty good and solid. These individual drills, though, on their own, still isn't the stage one of kata, however. That would come a little bit later. Each of these drills was good for learning a single technique or a single response to a common attack. But if you look at ten different common types of attack, each one might have ten different ways of responding to it, given the situation. Some of those responses might overlap, but you're still going to be left with about 80 or 90 unique drills, each of which has to be memorized both from the attacking side and the defending side, in order to practice them all. Memorizing that techniques would already take quite a long time, not to mention the time it would take to train each drill until you have a solid grasp on how it works. While one could theoretically write down the techniques, in practice this was rarely if ever done. There are a few reasons for this. Many practitioners were illiterate, the techniques are already hard to put into words even if you can read and write, and a written record might end up being lost or even stolen. Moreover, even if you wrote down the techniques, without memorizing them you'd still have to practice them either while looking at the written record or while having a third practitioner read the description of the technique to you. Even so, it is still possible that some people did write these techniques down, and in fact we know that works such as the Bubishi include written records of these kind of drills. But much more common than this was the process of stringing these kumite-style drills together into some mnemonic devices. These mnemonics would go on to be called kumite kata. It is this style of practice that finally makes the first real stage of kata development. Depending on how many techniques you were practicing, and how they were practiced, these could be organized into groups of like techniques, they could go scaled from easier techniques to more difficult ones, or they could even get shoved into one giant super kata. 